I really don't like the beginnings episodes where we learn about the first Avatar, Avatar 1. Which may be surprising, because not only do I like Legend of Korra, I really do, but among the people who viscerally dislike the series, these are often pointed to as some of the few good episodes. But they are some of my least favourite parts of The Legend of Korra. And to explain why, get yourself a drink, maybe some snacks, and let's sit down and talk through this, uh, thing. This is Beginnings, a tale of the less compelling. And this video is brought to you by my magical patrons. If you like to support me, especially my educational content, then the link to that is all down below. Thank you again. When people talk about why they love these episodes, they usually point to the stunning art style meant to recall ancient Chinese literati and Japanese woodblock paintings, that Wan and Raba have clearly defined and interesting character arcs, and that the story is tight with a strong beginning, middle, and end. And they're right, those are valid points to bring up. I especially adore the art style. It's okay to love these stories for how the story works on its own. But that's the problem. Beginnings doesn't exist on its own. It exists as part of a greater whole. It's both part of the broader Avatar story and mythos, and it's part of season two of Legend of Korra, which it takes place in the middle of. And not only does Beginnings not fit in with either of these, but it actively makes both of them worse. Part one, blue and orange morality. See, a lot of the, ahem, <clears throat> criticism of Beginnings rests on it contradicting or retconning the lore from The Last Airbender. And that's not an illegitimate critique. Internal consistency matters in a story. But that critique alone isn't enough to dismiss the episodes entirely, nor does it get to the heart of their issues. No. The problem with Beginnings is not that it adds to or changes the world building and lore, but that it makes the meaning behind the world building weaker and far less compelling. And with that, we need to talk about the blue and orange morality of spirits in The Last Airbender. You've probably heard of the terms black and white morality, good and evil. And what blue and orange morality means is that a character's morals or motivation just doesn't fit into this framework at all. It can neither be described as good, nor evil, nor anywhere in between. It's on an entirely different, unfathomable scale. See, spirits were neither truly good nor truly evil in the original series but nor were they even really a mix. Heibai is the spirit of Senlin Forest, and he only becomes corrupted and violent because humans destroyed this forest he protected. But he's not evil, nor is he concerned with the destruction elsewhere in the world. He's vicious, but pacified when shown that his forest will renew itself in an acorn. Even Ko the Face Stealer, perhaps the best example of this, not only devours the faces of animals and humans, including children, but has a personal feud with the Avatar, helps Aang find the moon and ocean spirits. His motives are unknowable, and the ocean spirit itself is presented as proud and vengeful and beyond our understanding. You genuinely get Cthulhu Lovecraftian vibes from the ocean spirit in this scene, Lovecraft's gods being defined by being so beyond our moral framework. An important part of the spirit-mortal dynamic is just how foreign the spirits are, that we cannot communicate with them nor truly understand them. Humans might have concepts of good and evil, but the universe at large in Avatar is a lot more strange. There isn't an objective good and evil behind it all. When I say blue and orange morality, what I mean is that a spirit can't just be described as good or evil or even morally grey. There's this impression that, at any point, we're only getting a glimpse of how the spirits think and work. Not only is this a unique facet of Avatar's fictional world, but this unknowable blue and orange morality lends a depth and richness to the world building of the spirits, making the world itself feel bigger and more complex by just how much we don't know. You can play with this a lot narratively, and the writers do. They build tension around this unknowability in whether Ko will help Aang, while at the same time wanting to devour him. The writers don't just tell us that the spirits are different from humanity, their world doesn't just look alien and otherworldly, but the very way that spirits think and act is different, if not incomprehensible to humans. Enter the magic carpets, Rava and Vatu, two primordial spirits in constant struggle against one another. Rava is supposedly the embodiment of peace and light, while Vatu is chaos and darkness. 
and allowing him to roam free in the world would destroy it and bring on an age of evil. At the start of Beginnings, you might believe that Rava and Vatu are both necessary and balanced forces in the world, order and chaos, light and dark. And you'd be forgiven for thinking so, I certainly did. They're clearly designed to be akin to yin and yang as mirror images of one another. Their introduction features this unsubtle imagery. Rava points out how a small part of Vatu lives on in her and she in him, like we see in the yin yang symbol. And their final battle takes place here, also laid out like a Taiji Du symbol. The writers clearly intended something here? And it wouldn't be a problem, because the world does need to be a mix of peace, order, chaos, destruction, light and dark. And that absolutely works within the framework of this blue and orange morality of the spirit world. But the problem is the narrative of beginnings itself doesn't support this comparison to Yin Yang at all. Vatu gaining any ground whatsoever is seen as a bad thing, rather being free to roam the world and do as she will is seen as a good thing while Vatu roaming the world is portrayed as an objectively bad thing. Instead, apparently, the spirit of chaos and darkness should be locked away, unable to do anything at all. A balanced world isn't both of these forces at work, equal and opposite to one another, but all Rava, it's, it's all Rava up from here. At no point in the story is chaos, darkness or Vatu ever shown to have either a good or even necessary role to play in the world. Nor is peace, order, or light, or Rava's influence ever shown to be problematic or bad. This is the writers telling us that they are equally important and opposite forces without ever showing us. But as I said before, the deeper problem here is that it makes the world building and themes previously established in The Last Airbender a lot less compelling. By having Rava and Vatu represent the very binary concepts of good and evil, more akin to the Abrahamic western god and satan dynamic than anything else, it undermines that alienness and unknown of the spirit world that made its world building so immersive before. Losing that blue and orange morality to replace it with something a lot less… well… less. Suddenly, the Avatar world feels smaller, more familiar, less expansive and deep. Like, there's less for us to explore in the world. And with that, you lose a lot of narrative opportunities because we feel we've seen and dealt to the greatest and most dangerous spirit. It also somewhat westernizes the Avatar mythology when its Asiatic influence is a defining feature that separates it from a lot of other western created fiction. Not only this, but a major part of Beginnings is about how Vatu transforms spirits into dark and violent creatures, his chaotic influence taking over and causing more intense conflict between them and the humans. Previously, spirits became corrupted or violent because of their unique moralities, because of Heibai's forest being burned down during the war. Their transformation into aberrations of themselves was a thematically interesting way to reflect their spiritual state of being damaged and heartbroken, telling the audience that harming the earth is harming themselves. But now? Spirits transforming into perverted versions of themselves isn't just because their relationship with the world is damaged, a manifestation of their rage and pain acting as their own mysteries and entities, but because they're forced to become minions of an outside demonic power. And that's just a lot less compelling. I'm left asking, why? What does this mean? Why does this matter? Why add this? Part 2. The Human Heart in Conflict with Itself Now, in all of this, a similar analysis can be applied to the character of the Avatar. William Faulkner once wrote that the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. The Avatar was always the bridge between spirits and humans who had a duty to keep balance in the world. But despite this, they were always presented as fundamentally human and fallible. Kyoshi created the Dai Li, Roku's bias allowed the war to happen, and Aang had bouts of violence and vengeance. Though they were a more powerful human, the Avatar state came from the combined wisdom and experience of all the past mortal avatars and it was more like a group of humans across the ages working together to solve human problems. Fundamentally, the conflicts in The Last Airbender always came down to individual flawed people, humans, struggling to make the right decision, the Avatar included. 
Of course, in Beginnings we learn that the Avatar was created when Wan merged with Rava, this primordial spirit of peace and light, the spirit of goodness by all indications in the narrative. And suddenly, the Avatar spirit doesn't seem so human anymore, and the real conflicts of the world aren't being resolved by fallible people struggling to make the right decision, but by godly powers above and beyond humanity's comprehension, divine intervention. This is compounded by the role of the Avatar state in Beginnings. One gets a massive power up when he enters the Avatar state and really fuses with Rava, despite having no avatars to draw upon before him. The clear conclusion here is that Rava is a source of power herself, but what does this say on a deeper level? That the real power of the Avatar isn't in the collective human wisdom and skills of ages past, but a godly power source. Not only this, but in The Last Deerbender, the writers made a point to have the audience grapple with what is moral for Avatars to do. Should Aang kill the Fire Lord? That was really interesting, and seeing Korra struggle with similar questions in Season 2 itself, which we will get to soon, is a truly fascinating source of tension that the writers can explore. But this origin story really takes the teeth out of that question. Rava embodying peace, light and goodness in the world makes the Avatar feel distinctly less fallible. Of course, we know that they are still fallible, but are we really worried that Korra is going to make the wrong decision when she can ask the spirit of goodness itself? Once again, Beginnings doesn't really retcon the lore exactly, but it makes the questions and themes behind the story just so much less compelling. If the only thing worth writing about is the human heart and conflict with itself, then none of this is worth writing. Part 3. How to shoot lasers with your mind. Towards the end of the battle with Vatu, Wan and Rava fuse by tapping into the raw spiritual energy of this, uh, giant bending laser beam. A question on a lot of critics' minds was, why did this help? What did it do? But I want to be clear. Having a soft magic system where things like this happen somewhat unpredictably to support the narrative and character arcs of those in the story, especially in such a fabulistic story as Wands, is okay. You don't need a hard magic explanation for everything. No. The problem is that it turns spiritual energy into a defined magical power source that you can tap into and use, like electricity or a laser beam. In The Last Airbender, spiritual energy had a very soft magic thematic role to play in this story. Think of how Guru Patik uses it with Aang in Season 2. Patik describes allowing spiritual energy to flow through Aang's chakras, through his body, letting go of grief, guilt, earthly attachment, that sort of thing. But spiritual energy, whatever it was, was a very ethereal and loose idea. Probably more a metaphor than a real physical thing. And it certainly wasn't a power source that could... <laughs> Though spirituality may help you better understand and therefore bend the elements, it never expressed itself as raw power. Instead, the way Mike and Brian wrote spiritual energy was to reflect how real spiritual strength comes in inner peace, self-discipline, patience, and self-control. The highly spiritual characters of Guru Patik Iroh and Pian Dao are all fantastic examples of this, and is something that fits directly and indirectly into the character arcs of Zuko, Aang, and Katara. In other words, the writers use spiritual energy to take a nuanced look at what it truly means to be powerful, and that's really creative and interesting. And what does Beginnings do with all of this? Once again, these episodes don't explicitly retcon these things. But they do muddy the waters around what being spiritually powerful means. The Avatar isn't someone elevated because of their dedication, wisdom, and intimate understanding of the spiritual world and themselves, but someone who tapped into a magical power source at the right time. Wouldn't it have been more meaningful for one to have merged with Rava after attaining a kind of enlightenment, allowing his spirit to live freely through reincarnation? And when using literal blasts of spirit energy, it begs the question, what does this mean? What does this add to the role of spirituality in Avatar? Even if you say it's projecting your inner strength outward, The Last Airbender already did that. It just did it in more subtle and more meaningful ways that built into the narrative. 
Think of how Iroh's keen spiritual awareness allows him to see spirits in the real world, to develop lightning redirection. This is just so much shallower. Oddly enough, they actually do this really well with Zaheer gaining the ability to fly through enlightenment in season 3. The point is, beginnings by writing the scene this way doesn't add anything meaningful to the narrative and it just makes what came before unnecessarily more convoluted and less interesting. It adds more without adding any depth. And finally, ugh, this type of video is exhausting. How do people go on like three hour long rants fueled by only a sweaty mountain dew induced rage? I'm like an hour into this and I'm already exhausted. <laughs> Beginnings also shows us that humans initially got the elements from the lion turtles. Now, the last airbender told us that they learned the elements from the original benders, sky bison, dragons, badger moles, and the moon and ocean. And this does still technically stay true. Though the lion turtles gave fire to one, we see him training with a dragon to truly master it. He's even doing the dancing dragon that we see in the episode The Firebending Masters. But like with seemingly everything else in Beginnings, what does this addition meaningfully offer? Spirituality was always deeply linked to bending, and where the elements came from was perhaps the core example of this. The implication from the story of Omar and Shu, whether they're historical figures or not, and with Yue's story and how they learned the push and pull of the tides from the moon and the ocean spirits, was that people worked to be deeply in tune with the environment around them, that they studied, listened to, and emulated the original benders to understand what the elements represented and mean, and that with this great self-discipline and spiritual work, benders were born. Fundamentally, it tells the story of humans learning and evolving as people, and it underpins the consistent theme of the power of spirituality in the series. It's also a very organic relationship to be had, in beginnings though, spirituality is just an add-on, an upgrade. While unenlightened children are born with the elements in Avatar, having a soft and mysterious foundation to the magic system can be better, and this is one example of that, giving depth without interfering with the story. It's a hard magic explanation that just doesn't really add anything. Once again, the episodes don't technically retcon this, but they make it unnecessarily more complex and weaker by taking away the thematic meaning baked into the heart of Avatar's worldbuilding, which is just so much less compelling. Part 4. Where did the wizards go? See, all of this, in the end, comes down to the forgotten role of mystery in both storytelling and worldbuilding. When Tolkien was asked about what happened to the two blue wizards of Middle-earth, he responded in saying, I really do not know anything clearly about the other two wizards, since they do not concern the history of the Northwest. I think they went as emissaries to distant regions. What success they had I do not know, but I fear that they failed. Tolkien, the author, the world builder, doesn't even know, and his works never provide an answer to this perplexing mystery. Intentionally so. There is value in readers not knowing things, or even the author not having a definitive answer, JK Rowling. <coughs> Sorry, Freudian slip. Allowing readers to imagine, to speculate, to infer from what information they are given creates an interactive experience with a work, so that they engage with it on a level that only they will. But mystery can also make the world building more immersive. Giving the reader a totalizing answer for everything that goes on in your fictional world can, ironically, make the world feel smaller and more simplistic, because there's no room for things unknown, for things beyond us. The relationship between humans and spirits no longer feels like a complex, labyrinthian history of mistakes and fallouts that we will never truly grasp the vastness of. Instead, it can all be traced back to one moment. Avatar 1. The over-familiarity they gave to the spirits in Beginnings undermines how wide and deep the world can be, that spark that makes it a joy to explore. And if dispelling a mystery is done badly, it can feel like the world isn't any more complex than what the reader is explicitly told, and sometimes the reader imagined things better than you will ever tell them. Sometimes it's good to allow them to do that. See, the mystery surrounding the origins of the Avatar and the nature of the spirits wasn't just the writers not getting around to giving the audience answers. The mystery intentionally helped define the character, the tone, and feel of the role their characters played. 
as otherworldly and genuinely unknowable beings in the case of spirits, and the ancient ever-present power in the case of the Avatar. Much of the magic in Avatar is very soft, and not knowing its exact origins and how it works underpins the soft magic role it plays in the narrative, primarily there to support the arcs of the characters. Awe and wonder at the fantastical is just as integral to the experience of a work as is the explained lore itself. It's not just what you tell them, but what you don't tell them. This is the reason the midichlorians in Star Wars are criticised so heavily. Fundamentally, to give an answer to a mystery, the answer has to be more compelling than having the question. And sometimes, it isn't. This is the sin of Beginnings Part 1 and 2 of Legend of Korra. Part 5. Korra. Well, we're barely halfway done here, but we're getting there, and I hope you're doing well. Remember to drink your fluids. Wow. Uh, this kind of video will not be a regular occurrence, I, I, I should hope. So. Beginnings undermines much of the broader Avatar story, but don't worry, it gets worse. Let's talk about the context of Beginnings in Season 2. Beginnings takes up episodes 7 and 8 out of 14 in Season 2 of Legend of Korra, a seventh of the series, but what I want to focus on first is the narrative set up beforehand in episodes 1 to 6 that's actually pretty interesting. See, corrupted spirits have begun to show up and attack the Southern Water Tribe, as a result of them neglecting the area's spiritual needs during and after the Hundred Year War. Unalak remarks on how they may have rebuilt them physically, but not spiritually. Part of this is because the two tribes have been split from one another for so long, and they need to be unified like they used to be. To remedy this, Unalak not only takes Korra to help heal the spiritually important site of the South Pole, but brings in northern forces to unify the tribes and protect this vitally important spiritual place. Sure enough, the Dark Spirits stop attacking. But to the south, this is a military occupation. They weren't asked if they wanted this, and sure enough, a civil war breaks out between them that threatens to corrupt more spirits. In the midst of this chaos, Korra also learns that her father was banished for destroying a spiritual region in the north, and as the civil war ramps up, we learn that Varric, a hyper-capitalist possibly on cocaine inventor, is using both sides for his own gain and war profiteering. By the end of this, Korra doesn't know where her allegiances should be, with her southern water tribe home, with Unalak revering the spirits, or somewhere else. See, Korra has been under the impression for a long time that there's always going to be a right side for her to be on, to fight for, because that's what she's good at doing. There's going to be a clear place for the Avatar. And of course, doing something is better than nothing. But the story directly challenges this idea in two ways. Firstly, by not only having Korra conflicted over what she should do as the Avatar, but questioning whether the Avatar should do anything at all. The problems between the North and the South started long before you were born. You can't expect to undo them in a day. So I should just sit back and let the Water Tribes go to war? No, but this situation might be out of your control. That the Civil War might be beyond Korra's control, beyond her role as the Avatar. Secondly, Season 2 critiques the role of the Avatar itself. The Avatar is often painted as a neutral mediator, but the writers make a point of how neutrality under tyranny is the same as siding with the tyrant. Unalak insists that Korra has to stay neutral, that she cannot show favoritism, and we get this scene. You're taking their side? We thought you were one of us. I'm not taking anyone's side. Hey! You're the worst Avatar ever! Saying I'm not on anyone's side isn't good enough here. What we're seeing is that season 2 before beginnings has a really interesting setup to explore cultural unification, war profiteering, propaganda, self-governance, and the role of the Avatar in an ever more complex world. That there aren't necessarily bad guys or good guys that she can side with or against, and more importantly, that sometimes the Avatar isn't the solution the world needs. Instead, offering that these are more deeply rooted sociological and geopolitical problems that maybe can't be solved by someone having the biggest nuke, by the Avatar stepping into the middle of it. These are instead deeply human problems that require humans resolving their differences. So, where does the setup leave Beginnings? Well, yeah. Beginning starts off because Korra nearly drowns and loses her memory of who she is, and supposedly, to regain her memory, she needs to reconnect with her avatar spirit. 
rather. The problem right from the start is that Beginnings totally interrupts the narrative that's been set up so far. There's no real causal connection between Korra needing to learn this information and the source of narrative conflict and tension in the Water Tribe Civil War. It's entirely an accident. This would be very different if, say, the spirits attacking the Southern Water Tribe reveal something about an ancient pact that they had with the first Avatar, and so Korra needs to go find out what that was. But the writers didn't do this. Nothing in the narrative either asks these questions nor demands the answers that these episodes give. The pacing of season 2 takes an arrow to the knee here. It's the equivalent of me being in the middle of a sentence and but the real problems, yeah, I know, we're finally getting to them, start after these two episodes. First with how it totally derails Korra's character arc for the season. The narrative is set up for Korra to grapple with what her role is in this evolving world, with the fact that some things may be out of her control and that sometimes the Avatar is not the solution the world needs. But this is totally dropped, with it all coming down to Korra standing up against the great objective evil of the universe. So no need to worry about that anymore, the world's most complex problems can be solved by throwing lasers out of your chest. Neither the audience, nor Korra, are ever forced to question what the role of the Avatar should be in a world of ever more complex geopolitics. In fact, in the remainder of the season, Korra only even returns to the Southern Water Tribe for one episode, and her motivation for doing so has nothing to do with the difficult civil war questions and everything to do with Rava, Vatu, and Harmonic Convergence. There is no resolution to this arc. It is wholly discarded. And secondly, what does Beginnings say about the really interesting narrative setup of war profiteering, the conflict between cultural unity and self-governance and interventionism? It says nothing. It says nothing. And reveals what's really going on behind the scenes here. No, every problem can instead be boiled down to gods of good and evil battling it out for the sake of the universe. That's where the real evil is, and that's where our problems get solved. Defeating Unavatu is narratively equated with solving those quote, problems between the North and South that started long before you were born, the Northmen leave, and the relationship becomes friendly again. Beginnings so jarringly changes the stakes of the story that the characters can be artificially justified in not worrying about these more complex and interesting issues. I'm left asking why Beginnings is happening, why it was needed, and what is the point of any of it really. All of this is guess what, and you've heard it before, just so much less compelling. Part 6. Smoke and Mirrors by the end of Beginnings, all I'm left with is the question of why. Why did they give this to us? What did it add, build on, develop, or give deeper meaning to? Nothing. It's just extra information that makes everything around it even weaker, both in the wider Avatar mythos and Season 2 itself. It's very pretty, but it's all smoke and mirrors. There's nothing actually there. And the most disappointing thing in all of this is how much better it could have been with just a few small tweaks. I wouldn't have written these episodes at all, but let's say that they happen. The writers were looking for a way to bring the Air Nomads back into the story. Aang and Katara can't repopulate with them alone unless they really got to it. So the writers created Harmonic Convergence in Beginnings, a great spiritual and cosmic event that supposedly increases the spiritual energy in the world to the point that it turns people into new airbenders. We mostly see this in Season 3. Not only is this horrifically contrived, but it ignores the long struggle of reviving a culture after genocide, miraculously wiping away the scars of the Hundred Year War. The thing is, Beginnings could have been the perfect place to set up a natural and more meaningful way for the airbenders to return, by showing how the humans first studied, followed, and learned from Sky Bison to get airbending in the past, Beginnings could have set up that same thing to happen in Korra's time. Imagine them finding a small group of disciplined people who wholly dedicated themselves to the ways of the Air Nomad, learning from Sky Bison in some isolated area, and then, just at the end of the season, one of them airbends. This better reflects the struggle of reviving a dying culture, that it requires dedicated people making an effort to bring it back, to keep it alive, not that, oh, the universe will provide. 
It would also fit perfectly with Tenzin's arc for Season 2, struggling with living up to Aang and the legacy of the Air Nomads pressed onto his shoulders alone. And you know what's even stupider? The island that Korra finds herself at the start of Beginnings on is an isolated community of very spiritual people in charge of a herd of Sky Bison. Not even kidding. It's like they knew what I wanted and just snatched it out of my hands. This would also allow the writers to establish Zaheer, the airbender antagonist of season 3, as a character early on, as one of these new air nomads, much like they did with Kuvira in season 3. The opportunity was right there, and they didn't take it. Secondly, if the writers were determined to have the avatar merged with a spirit, then why not both Rava and Vatu? Show that Rava's orderly and peaceful presence creates passivity or even cowardice, relevant to how doing nothing can be taking the side of tyranny, something vital to Korra's arc in the Civil War, while Vatu's chaotic presence is needed for forests to grow the way they do. By having one fuse with both of them, the Avatar now has chaos and peace, light and dark inside of them, equal but opposite forces. This at least keeps with the moral role of the Avatar in The Last Airbender and doesn't too badly damage the blue and orange morality that is so important to their world building. These two changes, though simple, would markedly improve the impact these two episodes have on the broader mythos and season 2 itself. But no, I wish for too much. And so here we are at the end. I don't like making negative content, I prefer to focus on good examples of writing and what we can learn from them rather than negative ones. I do not know how people make three hour long takedowns of Star Wars movies on this site. And I want to be clear, this is just my opinion, these are just my thoughts, this is the angle and lens that I look at the story through. And it's okay if you liked it, a lot of people liked how season 2 ended up. That's all for you. I need a drink. A drink of milk, because I don't solve my problems with alcohol. Uh, if you want to see more of this content, support me, uh, then the links are all down below. Come follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and uh, stay nerdy, and I will see you in the future.